Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be with you uh, here this afternoon and to show finally my support for the Mises Institute, for which I've been working for five and a half years. And so I've been taking part in various supporters' conferences. And I really always felt that my support didn't count because I was an employee anyway. And so they could just feed me through the weekend. Didn't, didn't add much. And now finally, I mean, this is the first independent contribution. I'm very glad that I can, uh, well, show how, how important um, uh, the work of the Institute is for me. And uh, in fact, as various speakers have said before me, uh, not, all, not only for the purposes of, of Austrian economics, but in fact for, uh, for the well-being of our country and of Western civilization in general, or, and of course for the civilization in, uh, of the world in general. Now, my subject is um, the dynamics of fascism. And I chose this title because I realized that after uh, 15 excellent speakers coming before me, I would have the not very enviable task of entertaining you <laughs> at the very end, preventing foreheads from falling on the stools of your uh, front person. And I, so I thought, well, the least thing that I could do is to rouse some dynamics uh, by the word, bringing in some of the word dynamics. But there, there's a more substantive reason also for this, which I will come later on. And so I will very dynamically present my subject <laughs> and not stand in your way with uh, uh, the well-deserved uh, retreat after uh, our conference. So the dynamics of uh, fascism, and I it also said variations on a theme by Mises. In fact, uh, Mises, as various speakers have explained before me, uh, uh, subsumed fascism as one particular type of socialism, uh, which is distinguished by the fact that where we have here um, an economic system in which the state regimentates all aspects of economic life. So we have um, a system of, all of an all-pervasive interventionism. Um, so fascism then falls um, uh, under the category of the theory of, inter uh, of, of uh, economic interventionism, and here, Mises has developed a theory that explains uh, the dynamics of, uh, of interventionism. And so my plan is then just to present, again, Mises' theory of interventionism very briefly, and then talk about various problems in his, accounts, in his account of uh, what the interventionist dynamics consist in, and then try to repair what I feel is somewhat deficient in Mises' account and then apply this to the case of fascism. But before this, I'm, of course, under the obligation, and I'm sorry I cannot really spare you this, to define again what fascism is, right? After all, I'm a university professor, so I'm supposed to define my subject. And uh, one definition I've already given, and that's the most substantive one, right? An all-pervasive system of interventionism. But there are three other connotations that are also used, uh, widely used. And they have some importance uh, for me, or will have some importance for us when it comes to applying the theory of interventionism to the special case of fascism. So there's first of all the connotation of fascism as being violence against troublemakers, okay? Smashing troublemakers, and in particular, historically, fascism arose as a re violent reaction against lefty troublemakers, right? Lefty revolutionaries. That's what uh, uh, the fascist movement in the early 1920s in Italy was all about, as Professor Reiko has explained to us. And uh, this uh, fascism and this understanding has, of course, well, it goes a long way explaining the bad press that they had, right? So they're, of course, called reactionary, but also then, of course, if you react against the left, there are only two possibilities. You're either stupid uh, because you really didn't get the point, or you are evil, right? And possibly both. <laughs> so here we have an explanation why fascism, fascism has such a bad press. It's uh, reactionary, stupid, and evil because it's against the lefties. Now, some of you might wonder now what my talk will all be about. Um, some of uh, the, the conference participants have expressed miscontent about the uh, one-sided presentation of fascism. 
and felt that there was not enough balance and so was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I felt the moral pressure maybe to, to weigh in on the good side, <laughs> which I will do as usual yeah. So the other uh, uh, widely accepted connotation of fa fascism is, and that's uh, it's an important point to, to make, is that fascism, in distinct contrast to uh, Bolshevik uh, socialism, has enjoyed general support in the population. Okay, so it's, a, it's an important difference, also important for, to understand the dynamics of fascism, that uh, whereas uh, socialism of, uh, of the Soviet style as Professor Riesman has explained uh, before, is a system that very strongly relies on a, a regime of terrorism, right? Uh, government terrorism exercised, wielded against its own population. That's exactly what characterized 70 years of Soviet socialism uh, in, in Russia. Uh, fascist regimes, as we have known them historically, have, at least during their existence, uh, until they were smashed in wars, uh, have enjoyed the uh, widespread uh, support of the population. And thirdly, uh, there, this is also a uh, characteristic often mentioned by uh, leftist opponents of fascism. Fascism tends to be chauvinist and aggressive, right? so aggressive in the pursuit of chauvinist um, objectives. Now, it is important, I feel, that we have a sufficiently large understanding of what chauvinism means. Chauvinism is not only given if um, we have some racial superiority theory, so we have the Aryan race and, and sort of superhuman beings and we have the underlings on the other hand, so that would be some sort of uh, chauvinism. Chauvinism is also given if um, we are chauvinistic about uh, the values uh, that we feel underlie our society and even if we uh, feel that these are universal values such as human rights, for example, right? the right to three warm meals a day, or, um, uh, or democracy and other things. Right? So if we, uh, even if we claim um, these are universal values, we can still be chauvinistic, right? namely in imposing these values on, on individuals or groups who do not similarly cherish them or not quite as much as we do, and could be very aggressive in the pursuit of this objective. So, uh, before we then come to apply uh, the theory of uh, interventionist dynamics to, this, uh, to the case of fascism in this, uh, in this understanding, we will now first uh, talk uh, very briefly about Mises' theory of interventionism. And as you have heard uh, a few times, it, consists, it contains two uh, distinctive elements. Um, first of all, Mises defines interventionism as um, as an order, as an isolated order uh, issued to a member of society to use his property otherwise, or different, in a different way than he would have used it in the absence of this order. Okay? And uh, Mises then points out that interventionism has two characteristics. On the one hand, it, uh, it is unsuitable, uh, is an unsuitable means to attain the ends. And the, uh, the example that he gives us is system of price controls, and his favorite example is always uh, the milk market, right? So we have a case uh, of, of an economy, you know, relatively poor country, and the mothers want to feed their, their babies. There's not enough milk there, and they start crying for help. And then uh, Big Brother government steps into place, folds up uh, its arms warmly, and imposes a price control. And what happens is, that as a consequence of the price control, the marginal producers, what we call the marginal producers, will no longer be able to produce profitably. So they stop producing. And as a consequence, then the milk supply is actually lower than it would otherwise have been, that is lower than it would have been in the presence or in the absence of this uh, price control. So rather than improving the situation on, on the milk market, rather than attaining its end, the intervention brings about the exact opposite. So Mises had first an experience of this. Um, uh, the milk market example was not just made up um, because everybody knew what milk was about, but because he had experience of uh, such interventions precisely on the milk market during uh, World War I, right, when the shortages of various um, uh, basic supplies among the milk. But he also studied the impact of price controls in the case of the housing market, 
I mean, even before World War I, when I mean, as, as a student he, had, he got the assignment uh, to study the problems of the housing market. Why was it that so many people were lacking houses in, in Vienna? And well, surprise, surprise, found out that price controls played a huge role. And actually, so he points out in his, in his uh, notes and recollections in his autobiography that uh, this was one of the crucial events that turned him to, be, uh, to become a libertarian. So this is the first element of his theory of interventionism. And the second one is the one that interests us most, namely uh, the interventionist dynamics. And here Mises argues that uh, precisely because interventionism tends or is, is un unsuitable means to attain the ends, um, it creates a dynamic or perverse dynamic of some sort. So if the government finds that the end that it sought to attain is not reached, it will uh, start to uh, or try to improve uh, on, the, on the first intervention. So let's say it finds out the milk supply has really decreased rather than increased as a consequence of the price control. Well, what it, will it do now? It will start to subsidize um, uh, the milk production, or it will start to impose price controls on uh, factors of production needed for the milk production uh, so that the marginal milk producers will again be profitable and, and so repair the uh, negative, negative impact of the first intervention. Right? But this, again, cannot work out because if we impose a price control on the factors of production, then their production in turn uh, will be cut down and so on and so on. So sooner or later, it will become necessary for the government to um, uh, uh, steer the entire production process and uh, impose a system of central planning. And here again, so Mises, uh, this theory uh, is not only logically coherent and consistent, it, but it was not thought out entirely in, in, in his armchair, but it was the result of, uh, uh, of observation. Right? Mises followed firsthand what we call today um, German war socialism. Right? Uh, so the imposition of the development of a, a system of central planning during the, uh, World War I, which started in 1916, precisely with price controls and food supplies and so on, and then ended very quickly by 1917 in a system of all-around planning. So I promised you to talk about certain problems. In, in Mises' account of interventionist dynamics, and that is what we need to do now. So what are the problems? Um, especially, as I see, uh, the main problem that we have in this uh, story is uh, that Mises' uh, feedback mechanism does not always apply, or the feedback mechanism that it, uh, brings about the dynamics does not always apply. So as Mises has it, the government imposes a first intervention then checks the result and sees, well, the end is not really attained. And as a consequence, then, we add on, we try to repair the first uh, intervention and uh, so intervene ever more, ever more. Now, uh, this is not always the case. Uh, consider a very simple e example. Uh, we impose uh, price controls in the housing market, and then still the supply of housing increases. Now, this is not something that would surprise us from the point of view of economic theory, because all we would say is that, well, that as a consequence of the price control, the housing supply is smaller than it would otherwise have been, right? But there might be other fact factors intervening <coughs> that have uh, had the opposite uh, effect, right? So that the overall result of all these different uh, factors uh, working together has been an increase of the housing supply, okay? So in this case, uh, the Misesian story would not work, right? There would be no Misesian incentive, so to say, for a further intervention. Everything would be fine. The government could say, oh, we increased, we imposed a, a price control, and the housing supply went up. So everything worked out fine. Our uh, policy was successful. There's no need to repair this, and so on. So we have a problem here. Uh, on the other hand, it is also uh, not always necessary for the government to be confronted to a, a problem in the first place in order to find a pretext to intervene. Right? The government might be just conceited enough to believe that it can handle things better than the market. Okay? This is an idea that, of course, sounds very outlandish to this group. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> but, uh, well, typically in capital cities, it's a, it's a fairly widespread notion. 
Right? So these people actually believe they can run things better than the free market can run them. A uh, very uh, important example is Keynesian macroeconomic policies, uh, which boils down to the belief that so we have this underemployment equilibrium on the, on the market, which means that the market is not really quite as good as a market directed by central planners in the capital city. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you have a huge cross of unemployed people in the street. All what they say is, look, we might have just a natural rate of unemployment, but actually we could decrease this further if we intervene and pursue an expansionist monetary policy and then dropped it a little bit more. So we have a catalactic unemployment there because uh, we don't have a Keynesian economic czar. So Mises then gives us only one scenario of interventionist dynamics. It's not necessarily the most general uh, scenario. I think it is probably empirically, if we look at it rather, it's a, it covers only a, a small number of cases. So how can we go, uh, get around this? How can we develop a more realistic approach of um, interventionist dynamics? And that's what I will try to do now very quickly. Uh, and I will start by a slightly different def definition of what interventionism is all about. So interventionism we can define as um, uh, a situation in which we have um, coercive co-ownership or involuntary co-ownership. Right? If the government imposes a price control or uh, issues some other order, what it actually does is to m impose itself as a co-owner of my resource. It says, well, you can do anything with you, that you uh, want with your apples or with your milk, but if you ever had the idea to sell it on the market, well, you will sell it at this price. Right? So it establishes itself as a co-owner of the resource of the citizens. Now, as we all know from uh, at least those of us who are married, uh, from first-hand experience, co-ownership works more or less well, sometimes less sometimes a little more, when it's voluntary, okay? <laughs> when it's voluntary. It never works if it's involuntary. Right? So what happens uh, if co-ownership is involuntary? Well, then uh, a situation emerges that economists call moral hazard. Okay, we have moral hazard here, which means that people now have an incentive to um, uh, uh, um, use as much of, of, of the common property for their own purposes, right? just taking it away from the co-owner that they don't like in the first place. Uh, now, this phenomenon uh, is, is uh, fairly well known under the name of tragedy of the commons. Right? So tragedy of the commons is, in, is, is the title of a famous article that um, a biologist by the name of Garrett Harding wrote in uh, 1968 or published in 1968, so in which he points out that, well, if you have com communal po uh, property, co-owned uh, prairies and so on, then, well, everybody sends as many cows as he can of his own cows, and, and they're eating away all the, all the grass. Nobody cares about replanting the grass and so on. And so we have the tragedy of the commons, tragedy of common property. It always disappears, always goes down the, the drain. Now, Harding was not uh, the first one to identify this problem. Uh, at, at least we have in our Austrian ranks a very famous economist who identified the problem, namely Mises, in 1914 in uh, National Economy. He, he stressed this problem. But most importantly, I would like to uh, uh, draw your attention to the fact that already in 1922, in his book uh, on socialism, in his treatise on socialism, Mises identified moral hazard. He didn't use this word. Right, but he identified precisely this, this incentive problem as one of the two great problems of socialism, <coughs> one of the two fatal problems of socialism. The other problem was uh, the problem of economic calculation, right, which is impossible in, in socialism. Right? But this problem, moral hazard, Mises, according to Mises, alone would make that socialism could not work because under socialism, no manager of any uh, production plant is responsible and he's just a co-owner, so to say, he's a temporary owner, so he has an incentive to divert as many of those resources that he controls immediately for his own purposes and not um, for the purposes that would be most uh, important from uh, the overall point of view. 
So we have then, from the point of view of this uh, definition, an explanation why interventionism does not work. Namely, if we, because we have moral hazard, and so we create on the side of the citizens an incentive to evade the intervention. And evasion can come in various forms. It can mean that you just delocalize your resources. Right? Uh, you sell your property in the, in, the, in the country where the taxes are high, and then you buy other property elsewhere, or you, you bring yourself from this country where you're presently to another country, you emigrate, right? you, create, uh, you go on the black market, you no, no longer sell in the light of day, and so on. So we have invasion, and this invasion has for us as an effect that the interventionism will not work. And we have also an in, uh, explanation why interventionism ever increases, namely because the government, conscious of the fact that it is just the co-owner of the resources, and there's still the other guy, uh, who is trying to, to save as much as he can for himself, well, the government now does what is called closing the loopholes. Okay, we know this. Right, so the government is cracking ever more down because, well, it wants this guy actually to use the resource in a precise way, but as long as he has some freedom, whatever, in the use of the, of the resource that is being regulated, well, he can just evade the regulation. And so the government has an incentive to crack down ever more to get him to do it precisely what it wanted him to do in the first place. So here, then, we have a, a realistic account of interventionist dynamic, dynamics, and I take it that they cover a much larger number of cases than we have it in the Misesian account. Now we need to apply this very qu quickly to fascism. And here I will uh, explain in a few words that fascism is, in fact, a very um, a particularly pernicious form of interventionism. Why is this so? Well, first of all, as we have noticed um, in the beginning, fascism tends to enjoy general support. Okay. So as a consequence, people do not feel the, the government interventionism as much as an imposition as they would feel it in, um, in a Bolshevik state, right? in, a, in a Soviet uh, type uh, form of socialism. Uh, if they don't uh, comply with the government orders, it's not only the government that is cracking down on them, it's also their fellow citizens. Okay? So there are various forms of ostracism that come into place because, well, the government is supported by general public opinion, and so the fellow, the dear, nice neighbors and so on, start cracking down on them too, denouncing them, spying on them, uh, no longer buying from them or selling to them, and so on. So uh, as a consequence then, uh, fascism tends to last longer. Right? Uh, evasion is less quick, uh, less thorough. Then, uh, secondly, fascism in its pure form, as we have said, is um, um, uh, worship of power per se. Okay? I said that fascism is a, uh, the application of violence against troublemakers. And if we look at, at the psych psychology of fascists, well, indeed, what they, what they like about this is that finally there's the big guy with the big stick who is creating order. And so they relish in the exercise of power per se. And as soon as we have this situation, we are confronted with, uh, with the following problem, namely with the problem that there's no more rational assessment or criticism of this, possi uh, of this policy possible at all. Right? We can apply... Uh, the uh, standards of reason to criticize uh, interventionism if there are certain ends that are being pursued uh, different from the interventionism itself. Uh, we can say, well, the imposition of a price control it does not help us to improve the supply on the milk market. Uh, so you say, okay, there is a, a, a contradiction between the uh, means and, and the end. But if the, if the means, in this case, the, violent, the violence, is the end in itself, well, there's no more criticism left. Right? I cannot say, uh, well, certainly um, uh, slapping people on the head and so on is an exercise of violence. So if we worship the power of our government per se, well, it's impossible to criticize it. So as a consequence, then, uh, in a fascist system, the growth of, of government and the growth of the interventionist system is much stronger than uh, in other socialist and interventionist systems. In its mildest form only, that, that was uh, probably empirically given, for example, in the, uh, in the Italian case, uh, fascism is a security state 
I know, certain similarities with uh, present-day U.S. policies of government uh, is supposed to um, uh, create order finally and create uh, security which is threatened from outside of the country or by uh, troublemakers within the country. And here, uh, again, so if it does not come in this pure form, fascism is liable to the critique of uh, economic argument because we can show, and uh, Rothbard and Professor Hopper and various others have shown it in various works, that uh, 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 government uh, interventionism designed to create greater security creates exactly the opposite, it creates less security. And if we uh, see this in the international context today, we say, okay, we have... Uh, uh, terrorist uh, threat, and as a consequence, we start uh, cracking down on various terrorist nests um, outside of the country. Uh, what, what we create, in fact, is uh, uh, a reaction on the side of those whom we do not yet perfectly control, in particular foreigners, who form coalitions right, and give us then a greater pretext for further interventions and so on and create then therefore less security than we would otherwise ha have enjoyed. Um, in conclusion, let me, let me uh, summarize. Frederick Bastiat, the French uh, great economist, once said that the state is the great illusion uh, by virtue of which everybody tries to live on the costs of everybody else. Uh, at the expense of everybody else. So we might say, well, the, the fascist state is also it's a great illusion uh, that the greatness of a nation depends not on its achievements in production, in arts, in the arts and in the sciences, uh, but on its ability to beat non-nationals into submission. Okay? And that is, a, is an illusion. Right? The greatness of a nation at all times, in all places, only depends on the, on the positive achievements of, of the nationals, of the members of society, and never on its ability to beat into a submission other people or to uh, exercise violence against other people. And the only way to get rid of this illusion, as uh, pro my uh, predecessor, Professor Riesman, has pointed out, is, of course, to propagate the right ideas against fascism and other deviations from uh, uh, the right path of, of society. And I can only concur that the Ludwig von Mises Institute is one of the most important institutions uh, designed to uh, fight the good fight. And I thank you for your support.